I don't know if you've ever met a legalist or not. Some of you have met them. Some of you have been them, right? Maybe some of you are legalists. What's a common denominator when it comes to their legalism? I'll tell you what I think, besides their focus on law, or as we say in New England and here, law. First time I ever went to the church in Massachusetts, I came from California, and a man got up and read the book uh, from Revelation, and he said, I am the Alpha and Omega, and I did what you did, laugh, but nobody else laughed. One of the things I've noticed about legalists is when you put people under the law, either man-made law or even biblical law, mosaic law or even New Testament law, and you don't give them any good news or grace, they become very crabby. They become sour, dour legalists, or they become very self-righteous and they think they do obey the law, so they become arrogant and prideful. When you put people under the law, law only, bare law, nude law, people become either arrogant and prideful or they become very, very crabby, dour, sour people. And so the title of my message tonight is, it's an odd title I know, but it's called The Social Justice Gospel Has No Wine. What do you mean has no wine? This is a Baptist church. <laughs> What's the common denominator with all these laws from social justice gospel? Do any of these sound familiar? Reject neoclassical economics. Denounce racial equality. Call for social action. Reform systems. Expose systemic ideologies. Abolish hierarchies, champion progressive political causes, destroy capitalism, promote interfaith activism, build a social change movement, repair the societal breach, fight, challenge, liberate, force hiring quotas. Listen actively. Speak from your own experience instead of generalizing. Share your own story. Be conscious of body language. Speak your truth. Recognize how your own social positionality informs your perspective. What's the common denominator with all that? It is law, 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 law. And people under law, people under the social justice gospel, they're either going to be very arrogant and prideful, or they become people that you don't want to be around. Hashtag Twitter. <laughs> now, there may be an exception or two, of course, but when you push law all the time, it has fruit. And so tonight, I want to talk about joy. I want to talk about the joy giver. And I'd like you to turn your Bibles to John chapter 2. Even over here in Hell's Kitchen, Rauschenbusch was influenced by a congregational minister named Charles Sheldon. And he, in his book, In His Steps, had a little slogan. Matter of fact, he could have made a lot of money on that slogan. And it was WWJD. What would Jesus what? Do. It's fine. Law is fine. Law is good. But law alone, man-made law or God's law, will turn people into sour, dour legalists that are underneath the weight of the law with no motivation to obey with no reason to obey, with no ability to obey. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at John chapter 2, and you are going to be very, very encouraged because Jesus is going to come and give joy. In the midst of all this, when I'm around uh, the social justice issue and its gospel, sometimes I get so entrenched in it that even myself, I think, you know what, I'm fighting, 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 fighting. For whom am I fighting? Why am I fighting? Is there joy even in the fight? Lise Emick said there's three major theological fallacies in the social justice gospel. One, I, I think this is kind of funny how she phrased it, man is not so bad and God is not so mad. <laughs> it's kind of got a little snap to it, doesn't it? I'm going to try my best to keep you up. By the way, have you ever thought about this? When God changes you, he gives you new affections, does he not? And you begin to love what you used to hate and hate what you used to love. 
Who would pay for Bible teaching hour after hour on Friday night in the city? <laughs> and then now we want that. Lord, feed us your word. Feed us your heavenly manna. God is not so ma- ma- bad. Excuse me. Man is not so bad, and God is not so mad. Two, cultural restoration is the gospel. Three, social salvation is superior to individual salvation. And I would add, law only. Social justice is law only. Next time you're thinking about this big picture, I just want you to think, law, 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 law. I need good news because, for me personally, I'm already crabby enough. I don't need more. And I don't want to become arrogant and self-righteous. Jesus comes on the scene in John 2, and everything in this passage is going to be about joy. So I want you to remember when you're talking about social justice issues, when you're praying for people, when you're thinking about all these things, there is a joy giver, and I want you to have joy in the midst of the fight. Sound like a deal? Because the social justice gospel has no wine. Now, whenever I come to a passage, I think big picture, what's going on in the book of John? And John is talking about Jesus. We like to say the gospel of John, but it's really shorthand for the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ, according to the apostle John. And there's all kinds of things in this book driving you to believe. There are the I am statements, right? I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door uh, to the sheepfold. I am uh, the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the resurrection and life. I'm the the vine and the true branch. There's even discussion of Jesus as the I am. Think about the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. I am who I am. Jesus is God. And one day, as Pastor Andy said, and I was very glad for the exhortation to start the conference, that you'll die one day and stand before God. And then what? When I thought I was going to die in the hospital just a couple months ago, I thought, okay, Lord, I'm all in on sola fide. Because if it's anything I have to do, I'm tainted with sinful works. I haven't done one pure thing in my life. I'm affected by Adam's sin and my own sin. And so I'm all in. Eternity is right here. If it's not trust in the finished work of Jesus then I'm going to be damned. So I'm all in. And that's what John wants you to be. He wants you to be all in when it comes to resting, trusting, faith alone. And you know in chapter 20, that's what he's driving at, so that you might believe. And when Jesus comes onto the scene, there's all kinds of issues when Jesus enters into humanity. And chapter 1 gives us a little bit of that. So today we're going to look at chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And then I'm going to ask you some questions at the end to see if you understand this rightly. This is a passage of Jesus turning the water into what? No, it would be grape juice, sorry. (laughs) Did you know, by the way, who gave us grape juice? It was a Methodist pastor, Pastor Welch, and he did not want his people to have real wine. And so he figured out how to pasteurize wine to give you grape juice. Cheers. Now, as we go through this passage and you see Jesus, a joy giver, I want to be very clear. My wife's parents, my parents, uh, my grandparents, lives have been wrecked by alcohol. I'm not promoting you to drink. Of course, the Bible always teaches that drunkenness is a sin, correct? But the Bible doesn't say drinking is wrong. And so we want to be very careful as we walk through this to think biblically, right? Guns don't kill people. People kill people with a gun. Sex isn't bad, but there can be all kinds of sexual sins. doesn't make sex bad. Just because wine has been used by people and done corrupt things, it doesn't mean wine is bad, especially when you think of it biblically. So we're going to go through this passage, and then I'm going to ask you some questions to see if you can understand what this passage really teaches, and then we'll tie it into social justice is all law, but there's somebody that brings joy, and we need to keep our eyes focused on him. Sound good? All right, and if it doesn't sound good, too bad, this is what I got. Did I tell you I almost died the other day? I'm going to milk that till the rest of, till I really die. I'd sit in that COVID isolation room day after day after day, and I'd say to the doctors and nurses, 
you know, I'm a pastor and I don't have much else to do. Is there anything I could pray for you about? And they look at me going, no, you need the prayers, bub. I'm not going to, I don't need to be prayed for. You need the prayer. Look at you. You can't breathe. John chapter 2, verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus also was invited and his disciples to the wedding. And when the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Let's stop there. Some hate this portion of Scripture because it's too profane in nature. Some hate this because they think somehow that Jesus is trying to get people drunk. Some hate this because it's too much of this Bacchanalian, Dionysus kind of wine god stuff. Why is this even here? If this is the first sign, and signs point to something, I mean, don't you think it could be a little more spectacular? Why this sign here and now? It's the first sign. Sometimes I think we read the Bible too fast. You ever try to read through the Bible in a year real fast? Don't know what you're reading, but at least you got your devotions done. God's happy with me. I got my daily devos done. When I moved to Massachusetts, they'd say, well, Word of Life has a slogan, no devo, no breakfast. And I'm like, I saw devo in 1978. Are we not men? <laughs> Whip it good. I can't listen to devo. <laughs> I'm dating myself. What, what, what's going on here? This turning water into wine doesn't seem so spectacular, really. What's happening? Now, if you want to get some details, it's on the third day. We're two days later after the meeting with Nathaniel. Uh, you can calculate this. This is on a Sabbath day, most likely. And weddings in those days would go for a week long. Now we kind of have the rehearsal the night before, we have the wedding, we have the reception. It's kind of a two-day deal almost. But back in those days, seven days. And you needed to provide the food if you were the groom. And you needed to provide everything else that was needed, including the wine. It was really spectacular. It was a big deal. Sometimes you'd have the groom come on a horse and ride up to the house of the bride and carry her away. And we don't know why Mary was there. Uh, tradition says she was the aunt of the bridegroom, but Mary was there, and Jesus, first two, was also invited, and his disciples. I want you to notice this is done in the open, not a monastery kind of thing, isolation, asceticism, or any of that stuff. We have uh, Jesus in public, right? It might have been John the Baptist who was more ascetic, but Jesus was not. I also want you to notice that Jesus gives full approval for weddings and to be there. Some people think, you know what? They wouldn't have ran out of wine if Jesus' his disciples didn't come. <laughs> That's what some say. Talk about reading commentators and Daryl Bach and other people. It's amazing what you have to do to fill up a commentary. <laughs> if I can write a commentary, anybody can. <laughs> Verse 3, the wine ran out. The mother of Jesus said to him, she's regularly called the mother of Jesus, they have no wine. It's like in Matthew 15, 4,000 people are going to be fed bread and that they have nothing to eat. And Mary, to whatever degree, knows about Jesus, her son. And so she goes to him because she knows he'll take care of the issue. Did you know, dear congregation, that if you did not have enough wine for the wedding, that you could be not just publicly shamed, but you could be sued because you didn't have enough wine for the wedding? True. Hospitality. Think about hospitality back in those days. And now we come to the first sign of Jesus. If you read weird kind of gospels of Thomas and other pseudepigraphal, apographal kind of uh, weird traditions that aren't true. No, Jesus didn't make a, a bird of, of clay and then breathe life into it. No, Jesus didn't make people blind because they didn't like Mary and Joseph, which all they have written about. Healed a man who chopped his foot with an ax. Healed James from snake poison. No, he didn't do any of those before this because this is the what sign? It's the first sign. I take that as, in Greek, the first sign. 
By the way, it might not just be in time, but also of primacy, the first sign. Now, most people, when they come to this passage, they get hung up at verse 4. This is what they want to know about. This is what they talk about. And they miss the big picture of what's going on here. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. People fumble with this because they're like, well, Jesus was rude, and he was saying all this to his mom, and he didn't say mother, he said woman. What's going on here? <laughs> well, one, it's not the main issue. Two, it's a, it's a Semitic idiom. It's a way to talk back in those days. Uh, he's not obviously dishonoring his father or his mother, right? One thing we know about Jesus, sinless. Because if he had any sin, then of course we would know we would be damned, but also he would not be raised from the dead because he'd have to pay for his own sin. So Jesus is sinless, spotless. Remember John the Baptist, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of himself? Of course not. Sin of the world. And so we know Jesus honored his mother always. He's not being rude. It's not sinful. It's not lacking respect. Remember when Jesus was on the cross and his mother was there standing by the cross of Jesus, John 19, where his mother and his mother's sister, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. So when you think about, well, what's happening here? This is his first sign. This is his first public or semi-public miracle. There's been a relationship with Jesus and Mary, and it's been mother and son. And that's the way it's always been until now. But now Jesus is heading to the cross. His hour has not yet come. And when you think of his hour in John, talking about his suffering and what's going on on the cross, he's on his way to the cross, and now there's a new relationship between mother and son. And no longer is it going to be mother and son. It's going to be savior and sinner. Yes, Mary needed a savior. Here Jesus, the Messiah, the Lamb of God, is not going to listen to anyone else because he's stealing his face ultimately to Jerusalem and setting his mind and his body and his soul like a flint to Jerusalem, and off he goes. Nobody's going to manipulate him, control him, tell him what to do, not even his mother. There's a distance here. When you look at the language, even of Genesis 41, when Pharaoh said to the Egyptians, go to Joseph, what he says to do, do. So Jesus has a mother, they're very close, and now we come to this first sign. There's this widening of the gap between um, mother-son relationship as he enters the public ministry. He's anticipating his death, burial, resurrection. His hour is going to come. Well, what else is going on here? Verse 5, his mother said to the servants, what a jerk. No, he didn't, she, they didn't say, she didn't say that at all, did she? She accepts it. She realizes what's going on here, and she, she says, do whatever he tells you. It may be a slight rebuke, but it's not sinful, and she's put in her place, and she says, okay, whatever Jesus says, go ahead and do. Remember, everything in John's driving you to believe. And here, so far, I see the flicker of faith. I see uh, some faith that Mary has in the Lord Jesus, even her own son. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Okay, let's keep going. Now, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. You could have wood containers, but to make sure there was no uncleanliness, you'd especially want to have earthenware. You'd have to have this special type of stone water jars. You know, if you added up all these water jars, 120 to 180 gallons, 600 bottles of wine it would hold. Jesus said to the servants, fill the water jars, or fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. So there's no funny business going to be able to happen. No monkeying around with what's happening. And he said to them, now draw some out. That's the language of dipping something down into a well and pulling up the water. Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. 
So they took it. He's kind of like the head waiter of the master of the banquet. Verse 9, when the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. I saw a children's Bible the other day, and it had Jesus turning water into grape juice. And so I just thought I would play along, and everyone serves the good grape juice first. And when people have freely drunk the grape juice, then the poor grape juice. But you have kept the, kept the good grape juice until now. Obviously, palates get desensitized when they drink. And so if you're going to have uh, two bottles of wine, one good and one bad, you serve the good first because the palates will be desensitized. Then you serve the bad wine. That's just the way it goes. Verse 11, then we'll ask the questions. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, tying it back to the last chapter, and manifested what? His glory. What do you mean his glory? I mean, Lazarus glory, uh, man born blind glory, this glory, and manifested his glory. And everything in John is driving you to believe. And now the disciples, and not just Mary, believed in him. Signs confirm. Signs authenticate. Signs attest something to be true. They point to something. And so what is this pointing to? Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is God incarnate. Jesus is the second of the person of the Trinity who has added humanity so he might be a representative. And Jesus, what he says is true. Chapter 1, it's interesting. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his Glory, glory as the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we've all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus shows his glory. Now, what I'd like to do, so we can understand this passage, is I'd like to ask six questions and then answer them so that you'll grasp what's going on. Because you're probably still saying, I don't get the connection. What's going on here? You said 98% of us don't understand this passage. And I'm here by the special Reverend Doctrine title that I have to tell you what it really means. No, I think you'll see it and you'll go, yes. You ever read the Bible sometimes and you think, I now see the connection, I understand it, and that's exactly right. Thank you, Lord. Something behind me here, a baptism or something. <laughs> remember Spyrus Zodiades? He was a Greek scholar, and I remember him preaching once. I was sitting in the front row, and there was a baptism right back here at Grace Church, and he was stepping back like this, and I thought, do you know what? God is so providentially wonderful. I'm thankful he taught me how to be a lifeguard in college. He just works all things together for good, does he not? Here I am going to have to rescue some guy, some old 61-year-old out of the baptismal. Question one. What did people think would happen in a messianic age? What would the messianic age be known for? How would you know you're in the messianic age? What happens in the messianic age? Any guess? The glory of God would be manifest. That's the answer. Listen to this. Isaiah 60, arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and the thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise on you, and his glory will be seen upon you. If you think biblically and you're thinking, I'm ready for the Messiah to come, those 400 years between 2 Chronicles and Matthew are in our Bible, Malachi and Matthew. What are we waiting for? What are we looking for? What are we hoping for? The glory of God is going to be manifest. We'll know the Messiah is here. 
Psalm 97, and the heavens proclaim his righteousness, and the people will see his glory. The first sign, Jesus is saying, the Messiah is here. His glory is present. Not just this glory of the transfiguration, the glory of God in John 17, the glory at Calvary, the glory of Jesus' ascension, but wine to water. I'm sorry, but water to wine? Question two, we're building. What is the context of these chapters in John? What's the context of John chapter two specifically? Chapter three specifically, chapter four specifically. Old is gone, new has come. Out with the old, in with the what? New. Jesus, Jesus changes everything. We know that's happening because instead of the temple where you go worship, Jesus is the temple. Instead of Jacob's ladder, Jesus is the ladder. In this whole book, it's no longer Israel's sacrifices through Passover. Jesus is the Passover lamb. It's no longer Jesus uh, excuse me, it's no longer um, the Feast of the Tabernacles. No, Jesus is the one that gives the water, the living water. Question three, what was the culture of Judaism when Jesus started his public ministry? And the answer is law. The answer is legalism. The answer is not just Mosaic law, although that's true, but all the other layers of law that these people have put on. Laws are like false teachers. They just multiply. They're like the flies in Egypt. They just multiply. And when Jesus shows up in this section, he's going to be dealing with massive intrusion of law on the people of God. Not just Bible law, but extra law. By the way, what does he do later in this chapter? He goes into the temple precincts and does what? Do you think the Messiah of the world who comes to give joy and peace and forgiveness and reconciliation, who propitiates the wrath of God for his people because he's loved them with an everlasting love, wants them to be under the yoke of the law? What do you think the first thing he's going to do when he shows up? He's going to take care of that. Think of Mark 7. And the Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered together around him. They'd come from Jerusalem. And they had seen that some of Jesus' disciples were washing, were eating rather, their bread with their impure hands that is unwashed. And we're not talking about problems of washing your hands here because of uncleanliness. I almost thought, you know, I just see something full of liquid now and I just think it's hand sanitizer. <laughs> I've preached for 20 eight years and I've never had a drink of water when I'm preaching, but I almost died. <laughs> True, that's the first sermon I've ever done that. I always tell my students, get rid of that stupid water there. What are you going to do then? Wipe your mouth off like that? <laughs> Jesus shows up in his legalism everywhere. He's going to liberate his, his people, not just from sins, but also these extra laws. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands thus observing the tradition of the elders. And there were these pots right there at the wedding, not for cleanliness and hygiene, but for all the extra rules. I might have touched a Gentile, better wash, might have done something else, better wash, might have been too close to somebody else and got a demon, better wash. And right there, those water pots are the legalistic system of Judaism, especially the Judaism it was imposed by the Pharisees that was above and beyond Mosaic, Mosaic law. Mark 7 goes on, when they had come from the marketplace, they did not eat unless they cleaned themselves. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, not even Mosaic law, but eat their bread with impure hands? And what did Jesus say? When Michael was talking about sometimes what do preachers say and how do they say it, how did Jesus say this? Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. You hypocrites, in vain they do worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men, neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. That's what Jesus came into. And I'll tell you what law does. Forget making you crabby. I'll tell you what it does. It suffocates you. Because you could never do enough. 
Like the Westminster Standards we're talking about, what about the law? The law is to be kept perfectly, entirely, exactly, and perpetually. How you doing? Right? Next time it's Easter and you see those little um, pink little chickens or whatever they are, yellow little chickens. They're all lined up right there. Marshmallow shape. And they're marshmallows. What are they called? Peeps. Peeps. I'm here to redeem peeps. <laughs> Personal, entire, exact, perpetual obedience. Peep. Now you know the Westminster Confession of Faith. Shorter and longer. <sighs> okay. You're welcome. You'll probably buy some now. How? I mean, the, the law is to show me my sin. And then now I have to keep other laws besides Mosaic law. I'm crushed. I'm suffocated. Or I'm going to think I actually do it like the Pharisees and become arrogant and prideful. Before Jesus preaches to Nicodemus or the woman at the well, He's here to deal with this legalistic issue. Question four. Is there any significance to the water pots? Is there any significance to the water pots? Well, I don't want to read too much into this, but I think it's fair to ask the question, how many water pots were there? I'm not into all kinds of numerology and everything else, but I know what six is and I know what seven is. Right? Maybe true, maybe not. I don't know, but it is fascinating to me that there are six water pots there. There are certainly not seven. Why do we use the number 666? Because six is the, is the number of man, and you just never, up to the perf- never measure up to the perfect number of seven. And so this man of lawlessness is never going to measure up once, never going to measure up twice, never going to measure up three times, 666. And now we have six water pots there for this external washing of hands by the Pharisees imposed upon the people of God. What's Jesus going to do? The Pharisaic system is barren. There's nothing in there. Question five, what do weddings often symbolize in the Bible? What do weddings often symbolize in the Bible? Answer, the messianic days. The messianic days. And the angel said to me, Revelation 19, write this, blessed are those who invited to the marriage supper, what? Of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Isaiah 62, it's the same thing. The Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. And finally, question six. What does the wine symbolize in the Bible? Drunkenness obviously is always sin. I've said that once, I'll say it again. But what does wine symbolize in the Bible? I don't think we've been taught this in our circles. I think we're afraid of what the Bible says. Psalm 104, God, you cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth. And wine, God, you cause to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. It gladdens men's hearts. Proverbs 3, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will be bursting with what? Wine. Did you know the rabbis used to say, without wine, there's no joy? That's interesting. In the Bible, regularly and often, wine is a sign of joy that God gives Isaiah said in Isaiah 55, you know the verse, don't you, do you not? Come, buy wine and milk without money, without cost. And particularly wine in the Bible means there's a messianic blessing. A messianic blessing. Hosea 14, shall blossom like vine, like <laughs> like vine, like wine, and their fame shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Turn your Bibles to Isaiah 25, please. In the New Covenant chapter in Jeremiah 31, it talks about wine in the Messianic age. In Amos chapter 9, it talks about wine in the Messianic age. In Joel chapter 3, it talks about wine in the Messianic age. 
in Isaiah chapter 25. I wonder what it's like when Jesus shows up. I wonder if Jesus is the Messiah. When the Messiah comes, how will we know it? Could there be a better chapter in all scripture? Isaiah 25, verse 6. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We've waited for him that he might save us. Let us be what? Crabby, dour, depressed, moody, or prideful and arrogant. When the Messiah shows up, when the messianic days of his glory show up, let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Aren't those verses wonderful? Pointing to our wonderful Savior. Here's what's happening. This whole passage tells us that the first sign Jesus shows his glory because he says like the psalmist does, in my presence there's fullness of what? Joy. Can you imagine how joyful we must be? Unlike many of our people that are across the aisle from this topic of social justice, we are forgiven. Remember every sin that you've ever committed, thought, word, and deed? Remember those ones that are in the closets, closet that you don't want anybody to know? Sometimes I think, I hope I'm not ever put up to a lie detector test because I did so many bad things before as a Christian. I don't want anybody to know to the point where I understand why people even say, "Is it? I, I should take my life because I'm so full of shame. Jesus knew every one of those things and died for you anyway, dear Christian. Like, well, I don't know how joyful that is. Really? That's why I'm here to talk to you about Jesus. I said to Andy, I'll come, but I'm talking about Jesus and social justice a little bit. I mean, Jesus should have come for our blood. When you're thinking Old Testament, vessels of stone, water turned into blood, that's what you should be thinking. Exodus 7, and the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, take your staff, stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, their canals, their ponds, and all the pools of water, so that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, even in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. And dear Christian, Jesus didn't turn the water into our blood. He turned it into wine, and we are free people. Jesus shows up. I am the Messiah. I replace legalism and law-keeping. I perfectly am going to obey the law, entirely obey the law, exactly obey the law, perpetually obey the law. And I'm your righteousness. And you can stand before the thrice holy God of the universe now, because if you have been covered by my righteousness and I have taken your sin... God couldn't love you less. God couldn't love you more because he loves you as much as he loves me. By the way, always get out of your mind. I had my devotions this morning. God loves me more. I sin today. God loves me less. Of course we should have our devotions. Of course we should not want to sin. But God couldn't love you any less because you are in Christ. It's called union with Christ. The messianic era starts now. And everybody else is going to be pushing extra law keeping. And I'm here to tell you, I give you wine. It's the most obvious sign to show you. And that's why I'm telling you the name of this message is the social justice gospel has no wine. They're just mad by default. I mean, maybe some of them are nice on the outside or, you know, you got a nice grandma and she's into CRT or you have a nice... <laughs> They're going to be because our kids are learning it and they will be grandmas one day, right? That's right? John the Baptist knew. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hear him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. Friends, we have good news for people. 
And I don't mean we just live the good news because we don't live the good news. We proclaim the good news. So don't forget in all your arguments and all your discussions and all your polemics, by the way, great illustration tonight of irenic and polemic. Irene, sweet and peaceful. I like that. Did I teach you that in seminary? <laughs> I mean, really, every religion of the world, if you came out of Roman Catholicism or Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses or Scientology, they have no wine because they have no sin bearer and they have no ultimate joy. Oh, maybe a flash in the pan joy, maybe happiness joy, but they don't have any joy. We have Christ, so we should have a joy-filled Christianity because Jesus is the Savior. He's your Savior, and he did it all freely. Can you imagine if you're a Christian here tonight, God the Father, Son, and Spirit knew you in eternity past and said, I'm going to go rescue you. I'm going to go rescue Mike Abendroth for my, the triune God's glory. And the Father predestined, the Son redeemed, and the Spirit sealed. Can you imagine you could say, not just Jesus died on the cross, but he died for me. That's why Luther always says, use personal pronouns, dear Christian. He died for me. He rose for me. He ascended for me. He's seated at the right hand, interceding for me. The new era has come. Everything that the Old Testament pointed to is now right before them and before you in Scripture today in John chapter 2. Arthur Pink said, apart from him who is the source of life, who is himself the life, religion is a cold and lifeless thing. Apart from the joy he brings, religion is joyless and hardens personalities. Do you have religion, even CRT religion? It will profit you nothing. Or do you have Christ? He alone can put a song in your mouth that not even angels can sing. Jesus died for me. He rose for me. He lives for me. Did you know, Romans says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness? We've got a lot of that. This is right. Of peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Dear Christian, Psalm 32, rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who are upright in heart. Jesus declared, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made what? Complete. That's what he said to the disciples. If anyone thirsts, Jesus said, come, let him drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So, to land this plane. You ever hear preachers and they start to land the plane and they're like, oh, abort. <laughs> like five times, I'm going to land this plane. And if you're not careful, I'm going to drink a little more water. Every religion, including the CRT, social justice, social justice gospel, it is a religion. It has its own verbs. It has its own sins. It has no forgiveness, though. Every one of these religions, it's a dead religion. They have no wine. They have no joy because the only way you can have joy is knowing that the Savior paid for your sins. Did you know, dear Christian, who maybe got in an argument with your wife on the way to the Bible conference, there's no condemnation for you in Christ Jesus? Did you know that? No condemnation for you in Christ Jesus. That doesn't make me want to sin. That makes me want to honor the Lord out of gratitude. I'm so guilty. Now the grace of God comes. I respond with gratitude. And by the way, dear Christian, you're not just saved by grace looking at the Lord Jesus. You're sanctified by grace through faith, which is a missing element in Christianity that we'll talk about elsewhere. Luther wrote some songs, and we know some of them well. He wrote one that you don't know very well, but maybe you do, but I don't. Dear Christians, let us now rejoice. That's the name of it. Isn't that good? 1523, he wrote it. Dear Christians, let us now rejoice, that of good cheer and with one voice, and dance in joyous measure, we sing in love and pleasure, of what to us our God has shown and the sweet wonder he hath done. Fully, dearly, he hath wrought it. Social justice gospel has no wine, but we know where that good wine's found. Amen? Amen. Cheers. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. We do repent. I personally repent of many times not being joyful.
And I need to heed the command of Scripture. Rejoice always, and again I say, rejoice. We have such a good reason to rejoice, the risen Savior. So may this group tonight be so thankful of your sovereign grace and love. May I be thankful for your sovereign grace and love that we would live another day with breath in our lungs to tell people Jesus Christ loves sinners. And Father, would you help us to show the joy and proclaim the joy to even those who are imbibed deeply in CRT because we know you can rescue them from that, including everything else. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.